It's Mark Evans, and you're listening to Marketing Spark, the podcast that delivers insight, tools, and tips from marketers and entrepreneurs in the trenches in 25 minutes or less. We're clearly living in a new and exciting marketing landscape. B2B and SaaS companies are adopting new tools and approaches to do business in more markets. Fangled Tech's Andrew Deutsch spends a lot of time working with B2B companies looking for marketing and sales strategies and growth. Andrew, welcome to Marketing Spark. Hey, thanks so much, Mark, for having me on. I appreciate it. I'm curious about your views on selling in the post-COVID world. When salespeople can't travel and see prospects face-to-face, how does sales change? And what are the approaches or the best practices that salespeople need to take and organizations need to take to be successful? The one, one phrase that always sets me off is when I hear people say, in this time, people don't want to be sold. And, and I, it, it drives me nuts because the reality of, of what sales is hasn't changed a bit. The only difference is we're not physically in the room. You know, at, at the end of the day, if you and the person who's involved in that sales conversation isn't enjoying the process, it's kind of like romance. You're, you're not doing it right. right. Uh, the, the, the difference is that you have to use different tools so that you can remain present, engaged. Zoom, the, the, very, the very technology that we're using has allowed us to, to really make eye contact, even though we're not really looking in each other's eyes, we're looking at virtual eyes, to, to be able to continue to ask the questions, to really dive in, do our research, and understand what are the challenges, the problems, the pains that our customers have, so that we then can propose solutions for them that solve those problems. That's what being sold is, is someone solving your problems. I think most people like that. Now, at one point in time, you were traveling more than 300,000 miles a year. Yeah. Meeting prospects and customers. When you look at this new reality with Zoom and the ability to connect, do you think that things like video conferencing are going to make sales more efficient, that we don't have to travel as much? We don't have to have as much face-to-face time. It's, I mean, certainly in some cases, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have sure. to see your, your customer in person. But does this mean that we can be a lot more productive and a lot more efficient? Absolutely. I mean, when I was when I was traveling, video conferencing existed. I've been video conferencing for twenty something years since since the early days of it, when it was grainy and sometimes you'd talk to a frozen face and all that that type of thing. But many many clients were resistant to it. Now, through necessity, we've all become somewhat comfortable. So what what happens, you know, in 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 terms of travel? If I was doing the same job today, I was doing then the initial meet and greets to go see touch, feel to verify that I'm dealing with the right partner in that country would probably still be happening. But the number of repeat visits to go back um, and and also the ability with with conferencing to be able to handle issues more efficiently in multiple continents at the same time, instead of this month, I'm focusing on Asia and next month I'm in Africa. There's a certain level of efficiency that way that, that allows you, even though with email, you can communicate with all those places. You legitimately could be on all six continents in the same day if you could count the six. You know, one of the things that I find in my own business is it used to be that when a prospect appeared, you would meet with them right away because you wanted to show that you were serious. If right. you wanted to get a, a phone call, it meant that you weren't taking them as seriously as you should. These days, when an inbound lead comes in, you respond by email and, and the first response is, well, there, you can't do it otherwise right now, but the first response is, do you want to jump on a Zoom call? And what I see post COVID is that kind of behavior continuing because we want to be as efficient with our time as possible. We want to avoid the travel time. And everybody appreciates that there's a lot of time and effort that goes into sales. So do you think that prospecting in that regard has changed forever? Ab- absolutely. And, and prospecting just with the, the, the expansion of the internet. I mean, when I was traveling initially globally, there was no internet. There weren't even fax machines in most of the places I went. You'd sit in the lobby of the hotel and wait for a kid on a motorcycle to come back from the telex office. So uh, the technology has changed all of that. If you were in global trade, even as, as late as the late 80s, you, you spent most of your time in books going through looking at listings for companies like the Thomas Register and things like that. Now it's all at your fingertip. So as tech continues to grow, the whole prospecting world changes. But, you know, if if I was in the office in, say, Cleveland, Ohio, and a guy called me or sent me an email or a fax or whatever from Botswana, he's not expecting me to hop on a plane. (laughs) Right. Yeah. 
a guy in, say, Texas or someone in Canada, maybe there would be a potential for travel within the next week or so to get to know them. So, you know, when you start talking about sales on a global, my territory, as we used to joke about, was all of the countries that weren't American, except Canada and places they talk funny. So I had Puerto Rico and, <laughs> right. and places like that also. So, you know, when, you're, when your territory is the globe minus the U.S., Canada, and, you know, a couple other minor places, it, it's a whole different, it's a whole different aspect of, of how you prospect, how you prioritize your time, how you choose where you're going to go next. <clears throat> there, there, there are countries that you could do business, but the cost of doing business there based on the size of the country is higher than what you could profit if you did an excellent job there. So right. all of that falls into play in that whole prospecting area. So you and I met on LinkedIn, and over the past year, I would argue that LinkedIn has evolved probably into places that Microsoft never imagined when it purchased LinkedIn for $26 billion a few years ago. How have you seen LinkedIn impact your business, just in terms of your ability to connect at scale, have conversations, drive leads down the funnel, maybe relate a little bit of your own experiences with LinkedIn? Yeah, there's there's been some real pluses and a couple of minuses. But the, the pluses are that that folks who are seeking me out that didn't that knew who I was but didn't know how to reach me have found me again. Um, and I've been able to prospect and and create contacts and and in different types of networks. There there are companies that I had always wanted to be able to penetrate before. And the people in those companies were never really on LinkedIn. They had a profile and that was that. And now people are more attentive to it. So when you send a connection request to somebody and in that request, share the reason of why you want to talk to them, it's it's speeds up that whole process of that first getting that first meeting on the negative. I, you know, you got to be able to sort through all the people with cryptocurrency scams and fake fake uh, uh, profiles of supposed princesses overseas looking for a husband and all that other scam <laughs> stuff that we all have to avoid. Although, although I am going to get that money out of that one bank that has $12 million in it from an <laughs> uncle of mine I'd never heard of. You and everybody else, I believe. Yeah, that's that. No, no, just thing. me. Just, oh, me. just you. Well, that's <laughs> the thing about LinkedIn is that it, it really does take a lot of time. And I'm sure they have to be thinking of better tools to manage connections, both inbound and outbound. Given the fact that sales and marketing people won't be traveling this year, I don't expect conferences to come back until early 2022. Do you see the B2B marketing landscape unfolding this year in terms of the, the channels that marketers and salespeople are going to leverage? You know, I was predicting the death of the trade show long before COVID ever hit. Um, the, the, the trade show used to exist before we had all of this technology when people would plan their entire marketing year for that moment of launching what's new. So, so if, if the trade show for your industry, say, was in November and it was March, you would be, you know, on a limited basis, kind of rolling it out to your customers if you were visiting and talking about it. But the big launch was November. Now, with virtual trade shows and the ability to use your website, to use LinkedIn, to use YouTube for videos or Vimeo, or however you do it, you, you now have the ability to bring everybody together anytime that you want at the convenience. All COVID did was just push the sword in a little bit deeper into the death of the trade show. There, there'll still be needs for it. There'll still be conferences and, and, and opportunities to do that. But for the most part, I, I can more efficiently bring a product to market using digital, digital technology than I ever could at a trade show. So, you know, it's, it's, it, you got to roll with the punches and, and, and understand that things are changing anyhow. Well, it does raise the question of the trade show's future and whether conferences are still viable and relevant. Another marketer that I was talking to said that when he talked to clients and asked them to assess the success of trade shows, well, 20% of the trade shows that they attended generated 80% of their new leads, which suggests that 80% of the trade shows they attended were a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Do you think a lot of companies are going to look at trade shows in a new light and say, we could probably go to only one third of the trade shows that we used to go to and, and save ourselves a lot of time and a lot of money and not impact our business in a big way. Is that a plausible reality? I, I think it is. You know, I was, I was involved in a project. We, we had created a new, a new type of barrel for aging spirits and wine in a project that I was working on several years ago. And we would go to all of the craft brewer shows, the craft spirit shows and those types of things. 
those shows are all, were already turned to a different model. People didn't come to those shows to look at all the new equipment. They came for conferences, educational panels, learning situations. And in between those, they'd come out and look at the new stuff. That was sort of the transformation of, of the trade show, where it used to be there would be you know, small you know, get-togethers and talking and, and opportunities, but for the most part, it was to see the exhibitors. So th the transformation was happening now with, with uh, platforms that are out there. There's Remo, there's Walkabout, there's a bunch of different ones now where you can actually attend virtually to conferences and have exhibitors who set up virtual showrooms so that you can see the materials, the products, and get a far bigger view of all of the offerings rather than a company that was, well, do we want a 10 by 10 booth or a 20 by, you can, you can really get people involved to, to, to see what's new in that format and not blow you know, 30 to $60,000 to get your team to a trade show. One of the interesting things as an attendee of trade shows is I'd go to many of the panels and it would be, and I would say to myself, you know, I could easily be on stage, not because, you mm -hmm. know, I'm a star or anything, but I had the same depth of knowledge as most of the people on stage. And so that held less value for me. The exhibits held no value for me because I already had all the information I wanted. It was that in-person conversation, building that relationship. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep the power of conversation while you eliminate the booths and the panels and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer that 90% of the business that happens at a trade show is either at the buffet or in the bathroom. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, people are laughing for sure when they hear that, but it's true. Some of the best contacts I've ever, I've ever made at a trade show were bumping into someone that, you know, I sat down at a table and look up and I see a badge of a company that I've been wanting to talk to for a year and never got in. But with, with these new virtual systems, like, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with the platform Remo. No, you, I'm not. You, you walk, when you go, I say you walk in, it's, you, you turn on your, your meeting and there's a whole series of tables and there's six seats at each table and you get to choose which one you want to virtually sit at and talk with folks. And then when the program begins, you go up on the stage. So you can switch tables and you can look at the list and see where people are you'd want to meet and truly network digitally and exchange information. And you also can put in there like your LinkedIn address so people can find you. And I've made, and several conferences I've been to since the launch of this platform and since COVID, I've made great contacts similar to what I would have done at a show. The only difference is I didn't, you know, have to give them a paper business card. I didn't have to shake hands, um, realize that, you know, I had dripped mayonnaise on my shirt while I was eating <laughs> and embarrass myself. <laughs> uh, shifting gears just a little bit and, and still focused on technology. One of the things when I was doing research for this podcast that you have talked about in the past is the over-reliance on MarTech. A lot yeah. of marketers have fallen in love, been fascinated with tools that are all around automation and operational efficiencies. Do you think that the pendulum has swung too far to MarTech and away from the fundamentals? That sounds like you're in that camp. I, here, here's, here's the deal. You don't build a house until you have a set of plans. The, the agencies out there who don't do their client a good service start with the tools and hope that somewhere along the way, it'll lead to a strategy that they haven't built. And the reality is the way you build a strategy today and the core of marketing hasn't changed in 20, 30 years. How, how do you know your customer, know what their needs, desires, pains are that you can solve? And how do you differentiate in that market space against all other competition so that you're the one that can fix that problem and they recognize it and how do you solve it? That's, you wanna build that strategy first. Then you decide, do they actually need a website? Do they need a social media campaign? Do they want to spend money on pay-per-click? I'm, I'm doing an experiment right now with a new program, which is a, a tech that, that allows you to be present in a meeting. Before this, you saw me goofing around with, with uh, what I can do in Zoom. So imagine being able to, for example, shrink yourself down, pull the PowerPoint up behind you. There's so many things that you can do to be present in the room. I can call a press conference and catch your attention while we're, while we're having a meeting. All of that can do is great, but first I have to have a reason for it. So we're doing an experiment on affiliate marketing with the training for this type of technology. The, the software is free, but we're selling the training. So we wanna see if affiliate marketing really works. All of the course is gonna be sold through affiliates. And, and it's, it's a true experiment. We think it's gonna be very successful. 
we, we first tried to figure out who are the people that could benefit from this training? How, how will it make their lives better? And then how do we get to them in a way where we're not spending a fortune on SEO, pay-per-click, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, all those types of things. So we, we, we got to the core, we built a strategy. And now with the launch of the program, uh, we think that we can grow faster than we ever would have and not spend a penny on, on all of that MarTech stuff that, that the gurus bring to you every day. <laughs> well, that's what I found interesting the last year is the return to fundamentals. So a lot, I'm seeing a lot more interest in positioning, marketing mm -hmm. strategies, buyer personas, the buyer's journey, um, tactical plans. A lot of marketers have re realized that the fundamentals matter. Yes. Technology can hide a lot of things. Conferences, for that matter, can hide mm -hmm. a lot of marketing inadequacies. But unless you know your customer, unless you know you have a great story, you're not mm -hmm. going to resonate. The market's too competitive these days. Yeah, I, I, I tell this story all the time. But if somebody comes to you and says, Mark, I know your business. I can build you the greatest website in the world. I can drive 100,000 people to it. I can build you a social media campaign. You're going to be the most famous guy. You'll have 30,000 connections on LinkedIn. If you don't respond by either running away or going, well, why do I need that? There's something wrong with you. Our core, the, the way everything that we do, and, and people get sick of me hearing, sick of hearing me say it, our job is to help our customer convert every touch into a voracious advocate for their brand. Because brand advocates come from a solid strategy based on what that customer needs. And when customers get what they want, when somebody solves their problems, they, they shout from the hilltops. They become a horde of advocates that go out and, and promote your business, whether it's B2B, consumer, whatever. That's what it's all about. And the only way to do that is to focus on the strategy first. You raise an interesting point about nurturing brand advocates and evangelists. And I think a lot of B2B companies fall down because marketers are focused on prospects. They're shiny, they're sexy, they're new. When we get them, we're rewarded and compensated. But after someone turns themselves from a prospect to a customer, as marketers, we ignore them. They're gone. And then we're on to the next prospect. And I think that's a fundamental mistake because if you don't nurture those people, they won't turn into advocates. And Correct. you lose a very powerful marketing vehicle. How much is it worth to you to have every customer who ever bought, had contact, or worked with you telling their friends what a brilliant company you are? There's a reason Apple has people lining up outside the door to buy stuff they've never touched. Never saw it work. They, they saw a promotional video and yet they're willing to fork out that kind of money on day one because there's so many people who just advocate for their stuff. Like me, you offer a fractional uh, CMO services and I'm curious about your take on the rise of fractional. Why is everybody talking about it? Why is there so much interest? And what does it say about the marketing and for that matter, the sales landscape? Well, there, there's sort of two sides to it in the marketing world. Number one, if, if you spend your money to hire a guy that doesn't have a strategic background, a fresh out of college guy who knows lots of tactical tools, built websites, you're, you're not going to get the same impact as bringing someone in who knows how to build a strategy. The challenge is the person who knows how to build a strategy is really expensive. And most companies don't need that guy five days a week. Right. That's really what it boils down to. So do you want to spend you know, $70,000 on somebody who's going to have to go out and find all of these resources and figure it out or spend on a guy one day a week, one day a month, depending on, on who you are, they can be part of your team involved and, and, and benefiting from the growth of your company who then empowers the other people to do all that other stuff. It ends up being significantly less cost for significantly higher impact. And the, any, any fractional chief marketing officer whose goal isn't to eventually grow the business so they can hire a full-time, isn't doing their job. It's that, that, that's what fractional is to us. I'm just curious about whether the rise of fractional has happened because a lot of companies cut back on their marketing last year and really tried to be very efficient about their marketing spend, or whether they've recognized that expensive senior marketing talent sometimes doesn't deliver ROI that they expect? I mean, it, is, can you pinpoint the reasons for the rise or the, the growing interest in fractional? I'd like to say the reason that the fractional is, is increased in popularity is because, you know, because I've been talking about it. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, there, there's a lot of different motives for different. There's no one answer. Many companies that we've taken on as fractionals, we've, I would say 90% of them because they've been burned by agencies that saw them as, as just a source of income. Right. They just kept piling stuff on 
they didn't have what, what I would consider to be a fiduciary responsibility. They're, they're focused on what we can sell you that has the highest margins, not what can give you the biggest impact. So that's part of it. And then the other is that, that there's a lot of companies out there that really want that growth, but they know they can't afford a full-time talent, nor do they need one because that person would come in, build the strategy, and then they'd have to get rid of them to, to replace it with somebody else. Right. So it's, it's a great beginning of building strategy. It's also a great way to, to take any company to the next level with, without having to spend uh, significantly more. It's, it's, I, I joke, it's the way to get champagne lifestyle on a beer budget. Love that. Love that. Uh, Andrew, where can people learn more about you and, uh, and Fangle Tech? Well, you can, you can check us out on, uh, check me out on LinkedIn. I'm sure you'll put it in the, in the, in the context. Our website is fangledtech.com. And our podcast is The Fangled Cast. You can catch us on YouTube. Uh, I think we send it out by fax, too, because we're old. <laughs> <laughs> the occasional, well, the, the occasional are, podcast, telex. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Telegram, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, smoke signals. Thanks, Andrew, for your insight. And thanks, everyone, for listening to another episode of Marketing Spark. If you enjoyed the conversation, leave a review and subscribe by iTunes or your favorite podcast app. For show notes of today's conversation and information about Andrew, visit marketingspark.co slash blog. If you'd like to suggest a guest or learn more how I help B2B companies as a fractional CMO, consultant, and advisor, send an email to mark at marketingspark.co. I'll talk to you next.